Welcome to CC, the classic car show. In this show, we take a spin in this unusual Italian coupe. We get behind the wheel of this very rare British sports car. Plus a comeback classic of tomorrow. Also on the show, we discover a private collection so big, it's a car museum. And we test your classic car memory in Know Your Chrome. So sit back and get ready to cruise through another episode of CC Classic Cars. Like all the car manufacturers in the 1960s, Alfa Romeo was keen to value add to any successful car chassis design by developing various body designs to fit the running gear. This was not a new idea and is still used in manufacturing today. Alfa Romeo's first attempt at putting a powerful engine in a smaller lightweight car, the 105 Series Giulia, was not only a financial success but a great performer on the road too. From this foundation came the popular and well-known Spider, a two-door roadster. Looking to widen the appeal of the 105 range, Alfa Romeo turned to coach builder Zagato to build a new direction to the range. This car is an Alfa Romeo Junior Zagato, built by Zagato using Alfa Romeo uh, 1300 Spider as a, as a basis. They uh, stripped all the, uh, the, the bodywork that Alfa Romeo provided and used the underpinnings, um, all the mechanicals, the gauges, etc., to then reclad in a Zagato made uh, body. They made of this 1300 version, uh, 1108, uh, between 1968 and 1972, and 72 to 75, they made 402 of the 1600 engine versions, which was slightly different in appearance uh, in bumpers and, and, and detail. Zagato were at the time a specialist coach builder and considered one of the more radical design houses in the land. Most of their work was destined for the racetrack and the Junior Z is considered the first Zagato design vehicle intended for general road use. The Junior Z was built between 1968 and 1975. From 68 to 72 with a 1300 power plant and from 72 to 75, a Series 2 with a sportier 1600cc engine and slightly varied body features. But this story is as much about this particular car as it is about the model. Uh, this particular car was manufactured in uh, June of 1970 and sold in Rome in October 1970. Uh, its original colour was yellow. Uh, when we saw the car, it was black and since has been changed to, to back to something close to its original colour. Not the exact shade, but fairly close. The Zagato team would be proud of this restoration, as the car looks stock at a glance, but has had some work done to get the most out of the Junior Z on the track. The thing that gets me most with this car is the, is the nimble handling. It is, it is underneath just like any other 105 Series Alpha, but it's a slightly shorter wheelbase because it's based on uh, a Spider. But it, the Spider has much thicker or more of a sill panel in the base, so the, the centre of gravity seems to be lower. And consequently, the thing turns corners like, uh, like no other Alpha. It's just a very nimble, handles like a go-kart. Uh, it's delightful. The 1.3 litre original engine is now a 1.4 with a modified cylinder head, valves, camshafts, exhaust, carburetors, differential and suspension. Yet it still essentially retains the original flavour. It just has far more usable power and far more fun to use on the road and the track.
the first three quarters of these Junior Zagatos were actually built with an aluminium bonnet skin and alloy door skins to reduce the weight and keep the performance in line with the spiders it was based on. This particular car has the alloy panels and the total weight of the vehicle is only 906 kilograms, which keeps the performance nimble. Uh, the other interesting feature with these cars was the uh, electrically driven uh, hatch or, or boot opening. Uh, a little electric motor with a switch on the uh, centre console and uh, you can open it at any speed at any time, slowly but with powerful motor and it opens at, uh, the, the hatch about three to four inches and provides a good flow through ventilation. And amazingly it does not take in any of the exhaust fumes which would happen on a normal car. Only 1,500 Zakato Junior Zs were produced over a six year period. But even this relatively small number pushed the Zagato plant to its limits. The Junior Z is considered a turning point for Zagato, both in design and in business, and cemented the automotive design firm's reputation that continues to this day. And as for the Junior Z, it was a design that influenced many cars through the 1970s and beyond and can be considered nothing short of a classic. Well, since I've owned the car, I've, I've used it on uh, a number of racing tracks so that it gets uh, maximum exposure. It, it's, it's, there's no hardship in that. It's absolutely a joy to use on track. Uh, the, the difficult part is trying to hold back a little bit because it, it does not have a roll cage and it's not really built for that but, and I don't want to wreck it. Here's a challenge for all you classic car fans. Know Your Chrome gives you a peek at some close-ups of classic chrome. Look at the shapes. Do you recognise the lines? Can you tell which car sports this shiny styling? It's too early for clues. But we can tell you it's a car, it's a classic, and it's very, very cool. Look closely, and we'll give you more hints later in the show. Next on CC, the classic car show. A very cool classic collection. A muscle car makes a return as a classic of tomorrow. And this British collector car. Lots of people love classic cars. And some are lucky enough to collect one or two throughout their lifetime. Some even collect more. Michael Finnis had a passion for interesting cars since he was a child and he has been lucky enough to collect quite a few. I was very lucky. I, when I grew up as a child, my father was a used car dealer, so uh, my interest in cars uh, was immediate. We went to all the car race meetings, and then I was lucky enough to work for a local car dealer when I left school, who also was a, a very well-known racing car driver. So I ran his used car yards, and then we, had other businesses and were lucky enough to make some money and I started to buy old cars that I wouldn't have normally been able to afford. And it seems Michael's passion for classic motor vehicles was a burning one. And what started out as a hobby soon developed into an obsession. The reason I bought a lot of these cars, the cars that I loved or my father had or cars that I saw on the road and, and liked the look of them. Uh, later, uh, the cars that I bought were really uh, probably for the, for the museum that had some sort of, uh, they were interesting, they probably weren't the cars that I would collect normally, but uh, cars like the Goggomobile and the Zeta Utility uh, had a lot of interest uh, with the public and the, that's the reason I bought them. And when we talk about rare cars in this collection, there are some wonderful finds. Michael's favourite is the Jaguar XK120, a very famous car when it was released. It was the fastest production car of its day and put Jaguar on the map. 
Having movie stars like Clark Gable driving one didn't hurt its reputation either. Some of the other rare finds in the collection are a Jensen CV-8, an exciting English classic with a Chrysler power plant. Two Jaguar drophead coupes, of which only 394 were built and there are only about 50 right-hand drive models left in the world. And for the racing fans, a very rare original 1947 Allard, built by Sydney Allard from the UK, boasting a side valve Ford Mercury motor. Even the Austin A40 convertible in the collection is quite rare, as it was only built in Australia. It wasn't until the next model that a convertible was released in the UK. These cars are now in high demand and are being sought out by collectors. And a car famous for its NASCAR heritage in the US, but more obscure outside the United States, is this Rambler Javelin, a top-of-the-range Rambler with a 7-litre motor. Michael wasn't just a collector, he used to race Jaguars, which helped get his classics collection into showroom condition. When I started collecting cars, I really started off with an MGTF that I wanted and couldn't afford when I was young. And then uh, it, it just grew and as I was lucky enough to be successful in business and I had my full workshop and we had our racing cars and when the mechanics had nothing to do with the racing cars, they could work on our cars that we were collecting and uh, this has grown out of all proportion. I never would have believed that I had a collection of this size. And what is it about classic cars that Michael likes so much he had to collect so many? Probably not so much that what I like, it's that I grew up with them uh, and if I had to put something down I, I really think classic cars are a work of art and if you look at modern cars you can look at a Mercedes or a Hyundai and if you don't know what badge you're looking at you can hardly tell the difference. So uh, at least with classic cars they are individual uh, and they really were works of art and they, they are beautiful to look at, easy on the eye. Some hate them and some love them, but there is no doubt muscle cars deserve a place in classic car history. When Ford's Mustang took the market by storm in the 1960s, Chevrolet hit back with a Camaro, first shown in Detroit in 1966. Described to the press, a Camaro was a wild animal that ate Mustangs. Since then, the Camaro has undergone some styling changes, but has always been a powerful, eye-catching vehicle. And now the fifth generation Camaro is available. And more interestingly, a convertible Camaro that we think has all the hallmarks of a classic of tomorrow. The styling of the fifth generation Camaro is a nod to the car's roots and the design cues of that 1960s muscle car have been elegantly integrated into the current bodywork. modern mid-engine sports cars around tight corners. But that's not what these cars are about. The Camaro convertible is all about getting there in style, with the wind in your hair and even some friends in the back. And if you need a little more power, there is plenty under the hood waiting. Chevrolet Camaro convertible. For us, it's a classic of tomorrow. There are 
several names synonymous with high-performance luxury sports cars, one of which is generally considered more exotic than most, Maserati. Maserati was started by the five Maserati brothers at the turn of the 20th century, and success in Grand Prix racing helped establish the mark. The company was sold in the late 1930s, garnering moderate success in racing and with road cars, before being purchased by Citroen in 1968. With a new company to back it and share technology with, the Maserati Bora was built, and from the Bora evolved the Mirac, like the car you see here. The Maserati Mirac was first introduced in 1972 and was essentially a lighter, cheaper, less powerful version of the Bora. Being a mid-engine sports car, by reducing the engine from a V8 to a V6, enabled engineers of the Mirac to use some of the safe space for a tiny rear passenger area, making this car a four-seater. The Mirac had various styling changes from its more powerful brother, some of these were due to parts being directly ported from the existing Citroëns, like the dashboard and brake mechanism from the Citroën SM, a sports coupe based on the famous Citroën DS. Matching its modern styling, the Mirac was a real performance car, thanks to its lighter construction. The Maserati Mirac gained quite a reputation as an affordable driver's car. The compact six-cylinder engine produced 220 horsepower, with a top speed of 150 miles an hour or 240 kilometers an hour, and many considered it to be superior to the Bora in terms of handling and cornering. Alas, Citroen went into receivership, and since then the Maserati car company has changed hands several times, and has undergone quite a revival as a modern luxury sports brand. So how well did you go with your first peak? How well did you know your chrome? Here's a quick update. Did you guess it right away or are you still pondering? Take a look at these shots. We're showing you a little more of the car here so you should be able to pick it. The answer is coming soon. Next on CC, classic cars. A rare British sports car with a retro look and we reveal the Know Your Chrome mystery car. Richard Henry Lee and Graham Inglesby Francis commenced manufacturing bicycles in Coventry in 1895 but it wasn't until 1903 that the firm made its first four-wheel vehicle. Leafs, as they were known, were produced in a variety of models and during the 1920s and 30s were a familiar sight on road racing circuits throughout Europe. This is a fine example of a Lee Francis 2.5 litre sports. A total of just 79 cars were hand-built by the UK firm between 1950 and 1952. 17 of which were exported to Australia. To this day, 11 of these cars are still running and John Woodburn is the proud owner of one of those cars. The car was um, expensive, it was hand built and so people who bought them tended to look after them. And I think uh, of this model, over 80% are still known to be in existence. Even so, to say that this is a rare car is quite simply an understatement. Yet surprisingly, current values of these classics are actually quite low, making these a great buy, if you can find one for sale, that is. As a result of poor sales, the manufacturer began to experience financial difficulties, and in 1953, production of these cars ceased. Ten years later, and the company finally wound up. Yet the poor sales of the 2.5 litre Lee Francis were in no way a reflection of the performance and build quality of these vehicles. It was, a, it was a very powerful motor for its time. It developed 100 brake horsepower from 2.5 litres. If you think of the um, other cars of that time, 2.5 litre cars were developing about 50 to 60 brake horsepower.
Under the hood, the engine has twin SU carburetors and is a little unique in that it has four rocket covers and hemispherical combustion chambers. The overall configuration of these large engines provides their drivers with plenty of power just when they need it. With the car being such a rarity, you would expect that access to spare parts would be a challenge. But according to John, this isn't the case. Luckily, even though Lee Francis have gone into liquidation a number of times since they started building cars in 1903, they, um, spare parts, particularly from 1920, are readily available even today. One company, AB Price in the UK, has got a very good inventory of spare parts and constantly makes new spare parts for the cars as they run down. Getting behind the wheel of one of these classics is a real treat. It revs beautifully, and being a long, strong motor, it will get up the hills very easily in either third or top gear. In fact, Lee Francis's are well reputed for their excellent performance in particularly hilly country. So if you're thinking of making an offer on John's Lee Francis, you better think again, as it isn't for sale. The first Lee Francis I had was a sedan, and I took that um, all over the country and really enjoyed it. But I thought, if ever a sports comes up, uh, I will buy it. And one did come up and I bought it and I have thoroughly enjoyed it again. It is a lovely touring car. I think it's a brilliant colour, probably the best colour for a Lee Francis car. And uh, it's uh, much admired wherever I go. People really like to see it and like to talk about it. So how well did you know your chrome? If you said it was a 1959 Jaguar XK150, you'd be right. Built in the UK from 1957 to 1961, the XK150 was the end of an era for Jaguar in terms of styling. The last of the old school sports cars, the XK150 featured a single piece windscreen and disc brakes. Two firsts for Jaguar. There are still plenty of classics to explore as we look back into the past and marvel at motoring's colourful and spectacular manufacturing history. Like this classic Alfa GT Coupe, many consider to be the quintessential Alfa Romeo driving experience or this enviable collection of motoring metal. Yes, classics seem to be everywhere. You just have to look to the roads and you'll find everyday people doing everyday driving in amazing machines from yesteryear. Yeah.